Hello everyone and welcome to the 10th episode of the PowerShell video series. Wow, 10 episodes. I was honestly not planning for the series to get this long. It's just once I laid out all the details, it turned out to be a lot longer than I thought. But this is officially the second to last episode of the series. And don't worry, at the end of the next episode, I will look at where you can go from this series in your journey with scripting and PowerShell and the like. So let's dive into the second to last episode. Now, in the last episode, we learnt about looping, in particular, the while loop, to repeat blocks of code again and again. And since we covered that last time, I want to start with something quite similar. Now, in the last episode, we were using a while loop to just keep repeating a prompt, or to repeat a menu system, again and again. But what if we wanted something to count from one number to another? Like this, I run this PowerShell script, and it prints out 1 to 100. Well, we could, of course, just put 100 prints in here for every single number. We could just duplicate code again and again. But not only would that not work if we don't know how many times we're going to repeat until we run the program, but just in general, it's really bad to copy and paste the exact same code in your script over and over again. And there's a number of reasons for that. The biggest problem with copying and pasting code is it becomes very hard to maintain. What if I decided to change this script to instead say the current number is every time? Imagine if we had 100 copied and pasted prints in our script and we need to change it to this. It would be an absolute nightmare to have to go through every single line and update it to what we now want. And in addition, it's just very hard to read and a lot of effort to scroll through just not very nice to deal with. So, a much better way would be to just have one line of code to do the printing, and then repeat that line exactly 100 times, and each time it repeats, we change some variable, and that's what causes it to be different, to go up each time. That's the best way to do this, and you can do that with just one while loop and one variable. Just have a little think about it, I'll show you how you can do it using one later, but first I'll show you some other ways you can do it, because there's actually a few ways you could pull off counting like this. One way you can do counting is with a for each. What you can do is you can create an integers array with all the numbers from 0 to 100 in it, and then for each it. Now I know that sounds like it would be quite difficult to make an array like that, but PowerShell has an operator to create an array filled with integer items between two numbers for us, and that's going to let us do this very elegantly. Let me show you. This operator is called dot dot, and the way you use it is you put the start number, then two dots, and the end number, and this will generate an array filled with integers between those two numbers. So then all we have to do is for each this to repeat code once for each of these numbers. And inside the for each, if we want to access what number we're currently on, we can use the good old dollars underscore to get the current item we're on in the for each. So we'll just print out the current number is, and we'll add the current number to that. So if we run this, look at that. And you can even count backwards with this too. Just put a higher start number, and PowerShell will generate an array with items going backwards. And if you want to have an array that, say, counts to one number, and then counts back down after, that's easy too. Just make one array that counts up, then add it to another array that counts down, and that will make one that counts back and forth. I really like the dot dot operator, it's a lot of fun and it makes counting great, but it's quite slow to create a whole array when we don't need to really. It's kind of a hacky way of doing it, even though it is neat. As I said earlier, you can count with just one while loop and one variable, and that's all you need. So let's think about that logically. How could we do this? We know we need a while loop, because I just said so, and we know we'll need a variable. Let's see, well, let's see if you can figure out how you could do this first. That's your task for this episode. Try and figure out how to count with a while loop. Here's the general idea, and it's down to you to try and write it. We need this variable to remember how many times we've counted so far. That's what it's there for. And the idea is it's going to start at 0, or I guess you could start it at 1, but we'll talk about that. 
and it needs to increase by one every time the loop runs. That way it's literally counting how many times we've repeated so far. And somehow we need to get the loop to stop running, or to be exact, only run when that variable hasn't reached a certain amount. That's the idea. So try and put that into code. Alright, so here's what it looks like. We're going to start the variable at 1, because when you start the loop, we've only done one time. And then, to make this variable keep track of where we are, we can add 1 to it each time the loop goes around. That way we're keeping track, we're slowly adding up how many times it's run. And now we need to make this condition such that this loop keeps on going until this variable reaches a certain value. So we're going to repeat whatever code we want to repeat while the variable is less than 10. As soon as it gets to 10 or above, the loop stops. And this will repeat 10 times, right? Well, let's put something in here and find out. Now, the nice thing about having variable i is we can use it in the thing we're repeating to get which repetition we're on. So I can print out we're currently on i and it will print out the number each time it goes up. And if we run it, there we are. Notice how it kept on repeating all the way up to, uh, 9? Yeah, 9. And if you think about it, it makes sense. This while loop is set to stop running as soon as i becomes 10. As soon as it adds up and becomes 10, it will be 10, and this loop will stop. You can change this by making the condition less than or equal to 10. Now it will repeat nicely from 1 to 10. Also, just in case you're wondering, yes, this plus equals 1 has to be at the end of the loop. Because if you put it at the beginning, our variable would literally start at 1 and then immediately increment to 2 before we even get to do anything. So we just completely skip over 1, which I'd imagine is not what you want. I suppose if you're only using i just to make the loop repeat, and you're not accessing it in the code, it wouldn't really matter. No one's looking at i, and the loop will technically still run the same number of times, if you really think it through logically. But it's just not something people normally do, and there's no reason why you should do it. I'd recommend just sticking to this at the end, because this is what people are used to seeing, and seeing incrementing the count at the beginning would just throw people off. And there we are! This right here is basically the definitive way to count in the whole of programming. This applies to basically every language. Now, you may be looking at this thinking, why did I call the variable i? Like, i. When you think about it, that's, what a dumb name, that doesn't describe what the variable represents at all. Why did I name the variable such a vague thing? Well, the thing is, this way of counting here is so standard in programming that it's basically a common convention that pretty much everyone agrees on to name this variable i. It's a bad name, but everyone knows, and now you do, that when they see a variable called i, that means that it's called that because there's loop counting going on somewhere. So in a way, because this is such a common name, it's actually more descriptive than calling it count. Because, at least for me, when I see a variable called just i, I immediately know, ah, we got a loop counting up, and that variable is the current position. The i actually stands for index. You know, like an array index. Which brings me very nicely to the next point, and this calls back to what I was talking about earlier. Earlier, I briefly implied we should really be starting this variable at zero especially if we're not using it. But why is that? Why would we want to do that? Well, to understand why it's quite common practice to start this at zero, if we're not printing it, we first need to understand one of the many reasons why people might want to count from one number to another. Now, in PowerShell, when you want to go through each item in an array and run code for it, you'd use for each. But in the programming language C, one of the most fundamental languages a lot of programming has been built on, it doesn't have for each. I mean, it doesn't really have arrays either, at least not in the same way as most modern languages, but if we just think of it as having arrays, it definitely doesn't have a for each. Because if you wanted to go through an array in C, what you do is you count from index 0, remember array indices, the things you use to access items in an array, start at 0 and you count to the array's length. So you start at index 0 
and slowly work your way through all the items in the array up towards its length. In fact, that's what For Each In Power Shield does inside. It's this. It repeats the code you give it again and again, counting where it currently is in the array in an internal variable as it moves along. So if I have an array here, what we could hypothetically do is instead of using the built-in for each, we could make a loop that starts at index 0 and goes up towards the array's length. And then if we want to access the current item inside the loop, we just take the array and access at index i like this. These two pieces of code are functionally the same. Feel free to copy and paste this code onto Visual Studio on your computer and run the debugger on this, in case you're having trouble seeing how it works. It's so helpful for visualising what's going on in these things step by step. Anyway, I think that's enough about counting. These are the two ways to do it. I know I went on a bit of a tangent there, but it's nice to know some of that, I think. Some of the context behind things you might see. There is just one more thing I want to say about this. This pattern here, with setting the variable, looping while it's less than a value, and then incrementing it, is so common and so fundamental that PowerShell, and most languages, have a dedicated structure that lets you do all three of these lines in one line. It's called a for loop, and it looks like this. And I know this looks super complicated, but this is literally just this in one line. Look. This bit sets up the counting variable, then this bit sets the condition for the loop to run, and then this bit increments the variable forward by one each time, all in one nice line. So that's nice. Almost every language in existence has four, and it almost always looks like this too, and PowerShell is no exception. So this exists if you do want to manually count. But the dot dot way also technically exists, and technically looks much nicer even though it's wildly inefficient. So keep that in mind, you can use that, and that's probably what I'd use for most things. Anyway, I want to finish up with loops once and for all right here. So, we have while, and we have for, and we also have for each. That technically counts as a loop. However, one interesting thing I want to quickly bring up is, in addition to the for each command here, PowerShell actually has a for each structure built in. And it looks like this. You say for each, and then in brackets you give a variable name, followed by in and the collection you want to for each through. And what happens is it's going to run the code in the curly braces once for each item in the array here, and each time it's going to put the current item into this variable. So essentially, these two are the same functionality-wise. Now I know that kind of begs the question, why does this exist? I mean, we have the command for each. What's wrong with that? These both do the same thing. This will go through all the items in an array and run what you put in the curly braces for each item. And this will do the same thing. Well, there's a few issues with the command. I honestly think the command's way more convenient, but being just a command does mean it has its downsides. Which is why this way of for reaching here, that's actually built into the language, is able to do some things better that a command just can't. The first thing the actual language feature can do, is because you can name the variable you use to hold the current item, you can put a loop within a loop quite easily, like this. Here, I'm looping through this array, and then within this loop, I also repeat this code ten times. So for each item, it runs this code 10 times, a loop within a loop. And you can do this with the for each command, but the problem is since they both use dollars underscore to show you the current item, the loop inside ends up replacing what's in dollars underscore from the loop outside. So if you want to use both of them at the same time like this, you have to fiddle about a lot with putting it into another variable temporarily and all of that. But with for each, since you can give each current item variable on each loop their own name, you can easily distinguish between them in here. And there's also one other benefit of using the dedicated language structure here, and that is that you can control the loop from the code inside. This is something I haven't covered yet, and I'm going to cover it right now. You see, in PowerShell, and once again most programming languages, 
There are two built-in keywords you can use inside a loop that allow you to control it. They're called break and continue. And you can use these keywords in any loop, a while loop, a for loop, or a for each loop. But you can't use it in the command for each because it's just a command, it's just not hooked up to work with these. Unlike these structures which are built into the language and can work with it. Let's start with the first keyword, break. You can use this keyword anywhere in the loop and it will stop the loop completely. As soon as you get to it, it will make the code jump out of the loop immediately and run whatever's after it. So if you wrote something like this, this for each loop will stop running as soon as it sees the item Alex. So it's going to print this, then print this, but as soon as the current item becomes Alex, this if statement sees it and says stop the loop here. And the loop stops running and it carries on with whatever's after. And you can use this in any loop, while, for, for each, whatever you want. And there's also a keyword called continue. And yet again, you can put this anywhere within a loop and it will make the loop skip straight to the next item. It won't run the rest of wherever it was, it will just jump back up to the top and go straight to the next item. So if I make this continue instead of break, it's going to print this, this, and this, but it's not going to print Alex, because this if statement will essentially stop it from getting to this line for the Alex because it basically forces the loop to move straight onto the next item here. And that is it for looping. I am truly out of things to say. There's technically one more type of loop called do while, and it's basically where the condition is only checked at the end of each repetition. It's not checked when you first enter the loop. But I really wouldn't worry about it, because it is so rarely used, I'm not even going to cover it. You can find out about it and mess about with it from the documentation though. Just good to know it exists, I guess. Alright, so that's everything for looping. So in terms of scripting, we've covered the idea of running things in order, we've covered if statements, else, else if, all of that, and we've covered the loops. There is only one more thing left when it comes to writing scripts, and you will have all the skills you technically need to make absolutely any script. Now the final thing we're going to cover is quite an interesting one, and it's called functions, and it's quite cool. A function is basically a command we've made in our script. We can make our own commands that run whatever code we say when you call them, using functions. The way it works is at the top of your script, you describe all the functions you want to have, all the custom commands you want to have, and you say what code you want to have run when that command is called, and that code will run when you call it. I'll explain why this can be useful and why it's so important to good programming in a minute, but first, let me show you. So, to make a function, what you do is you write the word function, followed by its name, what we want to call this function. I'm going to call this function say hello. Now I know we're getting a warning here and I'll get to that soon, but let's not worry about that for now. Also, this zero references text here isn't actually part of the code. This is Visual Studio Code adding its own extra markings to the function. I'll talk about this at some point later. And now in these curly braces, we say what code we want this function to run when we call it. So, since the function is called say hello, I guess it's gonna print out hello, right? And there we go. We made a function called say hello, and when we call this function, it's going to run this, it's going to print hello. Now, if we were to run this script right now, with just this in it, you'll notice that it doesn't do anything. That's because all we've done here is we've created this function. We've defined what's going to be in the function. It hasn't run the code in the curly braces, it's just said that this function will do this code in the curly braces when you call it later in the script. But to make the script do anything, we need to call this function. So just below the function, we're going to call the function, run the function. And we can do that the same way we call a command. You just write the name of the function. And now when it gets to this line, it's going to run everything in the curly braces. So it's going to print hello. And there we are, it printed hello. So it is in fact working. And if we look at this in the debugger, we can see exactly what's going on. So what happens is when we start the script, it first defines the function. Okay, that's fine, so that's now available to call whenever we want. 
and then we call the function. And when that happens, we can see our code jump inside the function, because what's happening is we're now running the code in the function, since we called it. And this is going to go and print our hello message. And there we are, we just made a function. Now obviously this wasn't very useful in this situation, we might as well just do this. And, you know, we just saved ourselves four lines and unnecessary complexity. There was no reason to do this. But that's how you make one, and that's how you call one. So now that we understand that, why would we want to make one? Well, during our time with PowerShell, we've been using commands a lot. And what do commands do? They take lots and lots of code and simplify it all down to just one action. For example, the command read host. When we run this command, Inside, it goes off and does thousands of lines of code to make inputting from the console happen. And that's what a command is, it's a group of code all batched up. Same thing goes for methods. Here's a hash table, here's the method add on it. All this method is, is just a whole bunch of code that you can run just by saying the name. There is tons of code in here that reaches into all the hidden away properties and data inside the hash table to make that item now be in there. And we don't need to worry about the specific details. All we need to know is this adds an item. And we can see that from outside the hash table and that's it. That's the whole idea of methods and commands. They perform a single action for us easily. They hide away all the specific details of doing a task for us. So you don't just copy and paste a thousand lines of code just to read an input from the user, for example. Imagine reading a script and having to read through 1,000 lines of code just to conclude, ah, that bit's reading an input. That would be madness, right? You don't really want to see all the smaller thousands of lines reading an input entails. And if you do want to see that, then you can go and find this command in PowerShell's code and look at it. Now, when we make scripts, and especially as you build bigger ones, sometimes it can be helpful to organize the different pieces of our script into these functions, these easy to run actions. If we have a 3000 line script and it's not organized into functions, trying to find something could be an absolute nightmare, even with the comments and the like. Organizing the different pieces, the different steps of that script into these simple blocks of code and then just cleanly calling them at the end can make it so much easier to deal with and work with. Because now you don't have to scroll through tons of specific details you don't care about. Now you can see a clear picture of the overall thing the script is doing. And if you want to look at the specific steps involved in doing a certain piece, you can just go and find where that block of code is. It really helps us create a clear structure. And organizing code into functions can also remove repeated code again and again. Yet again, we're reading an input. We sometimes want to do that more than once in a script, right? Maybe we want to read an input here and then read an input there and so on. Imagine if it took, say, I don't know, 10 lines of code to read an input, but you have to repeat those 10 lines of code every single time you want to read an input. That would equally be a nightmare. As I explained at the beginning of the video, you don't want to repeat the same code again and again, and functions are a fantastic way to avoid doing that. You just put the code into a function and call it whenever you need it. And if that code has some bug in it, it doesn't do what you want, you can just change the function as needed and it will update all of them. And that is the idea behind functions. They can help us structure our script and they can help us remove duplication. Now, just one final thing to say about functions. Just like real commands and methods, they can also return things back to the person who called them. But just before I do that, I want to admit something. It's quite a hard thing for me to admit, but it's true. I made a mistake, and I've had to carry that mistake forward for, like, five episodes. You see this write output command? Yeah, don't use this to print. You should really be using a command called write host. Because inside a function, and even inside a for each in the right circumstances, write output can actually do some very funky things that you probably won't understand. From the beginning, I really should have just suggested to use write host, but it just slipped my mind. So, throw write output away, and let's use write host to write outputs, so we don't end up with any weird behavior. Now, as I was saying, functions can return values back. 
just like commands and methods. So let's change this function a little bit. Instead of printing hello, how about we return hello? To do that, all you do is write the word return followed by what you want to return. I'll return back hello. And that's it, this function now gives back the string hello. And we can put that into a variable. And then say print out that variable. And there we are, it prints hello. Now the important thing you need to know about this return is when you do this, when you return a value, it stops the function here. So if I put a line of code after this, it would never get to this line of code. Because as soon as it gets to the return, this stops the function and gives back the value we set. So if I have a function like this, this will print out to the user the numbers 1 to 4. As soon as we get to the number 5, it returns from the function. The function stops running and it jumps straight back to where we ran it from, with this value given back. So it would never print the numbers 5 to 10. It will just go 1, 2, 3, 4, then hello. So, yeah. Anyway, let me show you an example of where a function could be useful to you. Here we have this little percentage script. It takes in three percentages, making sure each of them are between 0 and 100, as we did before a few episodes ago, and then finds the mean of them by adding them all up and dividing by 3. Now the problem I have with this script is look at all of this duplication going on. We've got the same loop and logic three times. Wouldn't it be nice if we moved all this logic into one function called, say, read percentage that could just do all of this? That way we don't have to rewrite this out three times. So I'm going to make a function called read percentage and then I'm going to put all of this into the function and I'm going to return the input we got, just like this. And now, instead of repeating all of this three times, all we need to do now is just say, read in a percentage and put what that returns into the first number, then read another percentage and put what that returns into the second, and read in a third percentage and put that into third. Look at how much cleaner this is. We just simplified all of that into this. Functions really can make things look pretty. And there's one more thing we really need to know about functions. And if you think back to what methods and commands have, you might know what it is. Parameters. Making parameters. Let's say we have now decided that we want this message to be different each time we call the function. We want it to say, enter the first number here, enter the second number here, and so on. Well, we can do that by adding a parameter to our function called message. Let me show you. Now, adding a parameter to a function is a little weird in PowerShell, but you do get used to it. What you do is right at the top of your function, right here inside your function, you write the word param and put in brackets, param being short for parameter. And then inside this param block here, you give it a list of all your parameters. There is a reason why PowerShell does it like this with this weird param block, and I think I'll touch on that at the start of the next episode. And then to add a parameter, you write this. You write square brackets and put the word parameter in it, like this. Just don't worry too much about this. It tells PowerShell that this is a parameter we're putting in here. And then after those square brackets, you put another set of square brackets. And in those, you put the type of object you want your parameter to take in. And then you follow both of these by what you want to call your parameter with a dollar sign on it. It looks something like this. So, in our situation, what type of object do we want our parameter to be? Well, it's a message, it's text, so it's going to be a string parameter. And now, what do we want to call it? Well, this is the message we're going to print out, so how about message? And there we are, we've got a parameter called message. Now we need to use this parameter in our code. No good having a parameter if our function doesn't do anything with it. So what we'll do is instead of writing this message, we'll write the message. And you can see this is how we access the parameter. You just say the name of it here. And then we also want to change this bit here. So instead of writing this, we're going to make these double quotes and put the message in there. So it says try again, followed by our message. And now when we call it, we can just provide what we want the message to be by adding dash message like this. 
And if you want to add a second parameter, just add a comma in here, and do this again, with the details for the second parameter. So maybe we can make a parameter for the try again message. So you're going to have a different message for the try again thing. I don't know, whatever you'd like. And that concludes this PowerShell episode. One more to go. At this point you know pretty much everything you could need to know to go and make a script. But I do want to talk a bit more about how you can find documentation and things. And really look at how you can survive without this series. I'll talk about that next time. So... I'll see you all next time in the final episode. Bye.